we are in the middle of a series that we started a couple weeks ago called Fully You. This is a series talking about understanding who we are and doing more than just understanding it, living it out and removing the roadblocks that we a lot of times self-impose on our hearts to be fully alive and fully living out of who God created us to be. And there's a lot of things in life that don't want us to do that. There's a lot of things that want to keep us from being fully alive in Christ. Right? I mean, you can just go through your life and go, you know what? I had this happen. I had this happen. I, I had this incident. I had this pain, this hurt. And go, what, were, what do those things do? A lot of times, they cause us to put up defenses. Right? We talked about some of the needs we have of safety and connection and empowerment. And when those needs are threatened and come against them, we, we react by putting up defenses that keep us from having to feel that pain once again. The problem with that is, is that not only does it keep out the pain, it keeps out love. It keeps out all the other things as well. And God doesn't want us to live like that. <laughs> he wants us to live full and free, full of his spirit and free from all those things that hold us back from being how he designed us to be. And so we've talked about that. And today we're going to talk about one of those steps that helps tear down those roadblocks, probably more than any other thing we can do in our lives. I really truly believe that if, you, if we get a hold of this idea and we actually practice it like we were designed to practice it, it will revolutionize who we are as people. And the reason I believe that is because that's what Jesus taught. Now, it's a word that very often we throw around, but very often are not good at doing. And that word is forgiveness. Now, I, I'm just wondering in this room, if I ask you a question, you don't have to raise your hands or say this out loud, but I'm just wondering, I, I'm betting that in this room, there are many of us, if not all of us, who have someone in our lives that we have not forgiven or that we are wrestling with, wrestling through forgiveness for. Or maybe you are someone that you've had to ask forgiveness and have felt like you have not received it. I think we've all been at some point in our lives where we, we've either had someone ask us for forgiveness or we've had to go to somebody else and ask them for forgiveness. And then what happened? Did, were, were you able to give it? Were they able to give it? Sometimes that fact in itself can be super painful. But we're going to look at the importance of that one concept today because that's what Jesus defines as a foundation for how we walk in freedom. But I want to tell you a story first. I want to tell you a story about a guy named Matt Swatzel. He was a fire chief. And uh, Matt was driving home one day after a 24-hour shift at the firehouse. And he was about three miles from home when Matt fell asleep at the wheel. Now, he doesn't remember falling asleep like you usually don't if you've ever fallen asleep driving. You don't usually remember falling asleep until you wake up someplace and you're like, whoa. Well, Matt woke up, but he woke up to a startling discovery. He crashed his car, and it wasn't into a tree or a light post or another car that was parked. It was into another car that had people in it. And Matt crashed his car into a woman named June Fitzgerald. June Fitzgerald was pregnant and had her 19-month-old daughter in the back seat, Faith. As a result of that crash, June and the baby did not survive, but Faith did. And so Matt then had to wake up to the realization of what had just happened, that he had just caused that accident, and that he had inadvertently taken someone's life, a mother. Now, turns out that the husband of June was a pastor in the area, and so when he found out what happened, obviously he grieved. <laughs> he went through the process with his friends and his family and support. And then he did something that a lot of people didn't expect. He went to the court. He went when, the per when, when Matt was being processed and, and all that stuff for what had happened. And he lobbied for a reduced sentence for Matt. So that he basically ended up with community service and a fine out of the whole thing instead of jail time. And then what he did once that, that sentence had been passed, he reached out to Matt and started to spend time with him. He spent so much time with him that today, six years later, they're best friends. And now this story got picked up by Today and different things. You can look up this story online if you want to fact check me. <laughs> but you can look up this story and you can see. And the reason that June's husband was to say, I, I was able to process this and then I was able to reach out to the person who caused so much pain and hurt in my life and forgive them was simply this statement. He says, you forgive as you've been forgiven. You forgive as you've been forgiven. And that revolutionized Matt's life and also June's husband's life, who was able to move forward and say, listen, I know this was an accident. You're a good guy. You worked while well, you crashed. It wasn't your fault. I forgive you 
but not just to say, I forgive you and then remove relationship. He forgave him and built a relationship, then allowed Matt to process the anguish of what he had done and move forward with that himself. See, that's kind of what forgiveness does, right? Forgiveness, it's not just about you. It's also about the people (laughs) that you need to forgive. And see, there's, there's this concept that we need to understand, and it's simply this, is that forgiveness is the foundation for a life of freedom. Forgiveness is the foundation for a life of freedom. That's something we have to understand because we're going to build a life of freedom. We have to have the right foundation. I don't know if you ever try to build something with a faulty foundation. <laughs> it doesn't last very long, does it? Right? We might try to put on the good Christian perspective, the good Christian like design, but if our foundation is faulty, that eventually is going to collapse in on itself. And Jesus teaches this very idea that forgiveness is the foundation of a life of freedom that we've been talking about. To come out behind those walls and live fully you, the foundation has to start with this idea of forgiveness. And Jesus tells this concept in a parable, which parable is just a story. And Jesus loved to teach in stories, if you read the Gospels at all. In fact, he primarily taught in stories, right? Because one, as humans, we connect to stories, and he knew that, because <laughs> he, you know, he made us. And, and, and two, they always had a point, but it caused you to think. He didn't just tell you what to think. Jesus never told people, think this. He always led them to learning how to think. And that's really what the goal of reading the Bible is, too. Is just don't think this. Just do this, do that. No, no, it's about learning how to approach life the way God designed it. Learning how to think in the world around us. And so when we're coming to this idea of forgiveness, Jesus very often doesn't lay out the process of forgiving somebody. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever, if you've ever looked up or studied a word study on forgiveness, it's in the Bible over 70 times. But each time you look it up, Jesus mainly speaks to the power and the importance of forgiveness, but very seldom does he give you the steps on how to do it. Remember why that is? Because Jesus is trying to teach us how to think about forgiveness, how to understand that it is a foundational piece of us, but he doesn't lay out the process because he knows it looks different for all of us, depending on the situation. When there are things that he says, do it in this order because this will bring life, he says that. So in this passage, we're going to look at Matthew 18, actually, right before that is a, it's a passage that many of you know where it talks about dealing with conflict, conflict between people in the church, conflict between other people. And he lays out very direct steps when you have conflict with somebody. He tells you, this is what you need to do to resolve that conflict, and this is why you should do it. But then he gets to a passage on forgiveness, and he doesn't tell you what to do. He just tells you why you should do it. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. And if you have your Bibles, you can look at it. It'll be on the screen, too, if you want to. But he talks about this very foundational piece of why forgiveness is so important. And so, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to bring this up before I forgot. Very often, when we hear this idea of forgiveness— we love the concept, and we know that we should, and we, know, we think that it, everyone else should be very forgiving, don't we? <laughs> we love the idea of being forgiven or being thought of being forgiven when we mess up, and we think everybody else should be super forgiving. So the concept is nice until we actually have to apply it. That's why I love to see it, what C.S. Lewis says, and he said, everyone says forgiveness is lovely until there's something to forgive. <laughs> I love that concept because that's exactly, that's so true of all of us, right? Forgiveness is a great idea until I have to do it or until I need it. And so Jesus addresses that in this passage in Matthew 18. So it starts off, Then Peter came to to him, who is Jesus, and asked, Lord, how often shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now, that's important to understand because Peter is coming to Jesus. And I honestly think, if you know Peter, I think he has someone in mind when he asks that question. Because if you read other trans, this is the New Living Translation, but in, in the NIV and other ones it says, How often shall I forgive my brother or my sister? I think Peter, honestly, and this is just my interpretation of this, so don't like, you know, make it a big, bigger deal than that. But I think he was coming to Jesus thinking of his brother, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew was with the crowd. Andrew was part of, you know, the disciples. He was around there. I think Peter had some grievances with his brother, and he's going to Jesus to figure out how much he actually has to be nice to him. How many times do I actually have to forgive my brother, Jesus? Like, let's figure this out. I get conflict. Like, if you read, if you read the verses before, I get this is how you should handle conflict. That's all well and good. Thanks for laying out the steps. Okay, but now how many times do I actually have to do it? <laughs> I, I mean, we do that, right? Jesus, like, thank you for describing that, but how much do I really have to do it, right? What, what, like, what's the limit on my forgiveness, God? Tell me how much, right? Because my brother, he's annoying, right? He, does a stu- he leaves the top off the toothpaste, right? Like, Andrew me- messes up our room and refuses to clean up his side of the room. You know, like, mom likes him better. You know, you can just picture what Peter's thinking about his brother trying to figure out, okay, how much do I actually have to forgive this guy who annoys me? And so he's like, conflict sounds great, but God, what do I have to do with it? So he comes to Jesus and he says, God, give me a number. Tell me me the number, the limit, right? 
How many times do we want God to do that to us? God, just tell us the limit. Tell us exactly how many times I have to forgive that person because then when I, they've done that, then I can just be done with them. When I've done it enough times, then I can write them off. And he says, seven. Seven times sounds good, Jesus. Now, the reason he says seven is because back then, the Pharisees taught that you only need to forgive people three times. That's from the Old Testament. They said, listen, you forgive someone three times, and on the fourth time, be done with them. That's what they taught people. So Peter's thinking, I'm imagining going to Jesus and being like, yo, I'm going to up the ante and sound really good. I'm going to go from three. I'm going to go seven. I'm going to more than double what they teach. Look at me. I'm really forgiving God seven times. And Jesus, I, I have to imagine, just laughs. There's some humor in this passage. If you read the Bible that way, I imagine Jesus kind of chuckles and he's like, Peter, he's like, no. He's like, not seven times, but 70 times seven. So if you want to do the math on that, 490 times. And I know people who are like, well, okay, five, 491, I'm done, right? <laughs> That's not the point of what Jesus is saying here. Because in other, other translations, he'll say 77 times. The idea is that there's no number. There's no, there's no uh, like limit to the amount we're supposed to forgive people. Because seven in the Hebrew, it was a perfect number. It, it, it symbolized continual, like seven days in a week, and then it starts over again. Continues, it symbolizes a cycle of content, continuity. So he's saying when it's seven times 70, he's saying it's, it's endless, there is no number. What he's telling Peter is what we all need to hear. Throw away your scorecard. Put away the calculator. You can't figure this out as far as, well, I'm, this is the limit. Jesus says there is no limit to the amount we're supposed to forgive people. And then he goes on to tell them this story. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. And in the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed, who owed him millions of dollars. The debtor couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. It's a very common practice back in those days that if you owed money and you couldn't afford it, they would sell all your stuff and everything you owned to make up for the debt. And then if you still couldn't pay it, they'd throw you in prison. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. And you understand, this is, this is a big deal. Because when you, look, when you look at, he had borrowed so much money from him, he owed him millions of dollars, is what this guy owed the king. Now, in some translations, if you look in your Bible, it might say he owed him 10,000 talents. You know, that, that idea of a talent in the Bible really is equivalent to not, a, not a, a, an amount, but a weight. They did talents in weight. So really what they're saying, when they say a talent, they're talking about 350 metric tons of silver that this guy would have owed the king. Now, if you break down the numbers on that, essentially, according to what the person would have made back then, and you do all the math, and I'm not going to bore you with all the crazy numbers you can break down on this, what he's showing you is, is that what this guy owed was more than he could ever pay in a million lifetimes. Like, I think someone actually did the math one time when I saw it, and it was something like 150,000 lifetimes he would need to pay off the debt that he had to the king <laughs> in the amount of money that they talk about in this passage. So you get the picture. Jesus is using a little hyperbole here, but he's showing you it was more than this guy could ever, ever pay off. More than he could pay off in a million lifetimes, this guy owed the king. And then he threw himself down at his feet, and he couldn't pay, and he begged him. And what did he do? The king forgave his debt. Now, why is Jesus sharing this parable to start off with this idea of forgiving people? Because he wants us to know that the foundation of forgiveness that we need to lay starts with one very important thing we need to remember. How much we've been forgiven. Because in this story, we are the debtor who owed more than we could ever pay in a million lifetimes. He's holding up a mirror to the people. He's holding up a mirror to Peter when he asks this question to say, okay, Peter, you want to know a number of how much you need to forgive somebody. Let's start with you remembering exactly how much you've been forgiven. How much do you owe? How much should you have owed? Right, because we need to understand something about the forgiveness of God. It's both extravagant and costly. The love of God, the forgiveness that we've received from our Heavenly Father is both extravagant and costly. It's extravagant because the amount of money this guy owed, the millions of dollars, when the king forgave him, you know what happens to that debt? The king swallows that. He eats it. That's on him. And when it's that much money, that means that's coming from the king's treasury. That means that he's going to be maybe in the red at the end of the year for his kingdom because he's allowing this guy who owes so much off the hook, and that's going to hurt him as the king. So he's extravagantly giving. He's extravagantly lavishing on someone more than they deserve, more than they could ever ask for it because they couldn't afford it. And it's costing him something personally. 
That's Jesus. That's our heavenly father. He extravagantly gives forgiveness to us when our debts have amounted to way more than we could ever pay in a million lifetimes to when our sins have accounted and, and added up to way more than we could ever pay for. Jesus says, hey, listen, I get it. There is a debt that's owed, but I'll take it on me. I'll eat that debt. He went to the cross to prove that. And it cost him something. As the king in this story represents, he's a type of Jesus. He's not exactly like Jesus, get me wrong, because Jesus doesn't have anger and all that. But he's showing that there is an extravagance and a cost that is, comes to this idea of forgiveness. And when we forget that, when we forget how much we've been forgiven, then what happens, and what happens a lot, <laughs> is we turn in to the next guy that's further down in the, in the story. Because he doesn't just stop there with the parable. He says, once that guy's been forgiven, once that debtor who owed millions of dollars gets set free and the king eats it and, and absorbs that debt and says, okay, you know what? I, I'm going to show you grace. Because that's what the king did. He showed grace just like we've all been shown grace. I mean, think about what we owe and how much Jesus has forgiven us. We are that debtor who owed more than we could pay and the grace that he showed us to say, I'll take that so you don't have to. That's, that's the cross. That's grace that we cannot even fathom. Now, here's the deal. What he could have done in that scenario is use the law on his side. He had every right as the king to throw that guy in jail and even maybe even have him killed for all the debt that he had. He could have acted asked for justice. And many of us and our society at large will tell you that that's really what we need to be after is justice. Vengeance is what defines and will allow you to be free again. Finally, just get revenge on the person who hurt you and then you can be satisfied. Get justice and then you can be satisfied. See them prosecuted to the full extent of the law and get what they have coming and then you'll be free from the pain of it. That's not what Jesus teaches. Yeah, there's consequences of sin, you don't let, necessarily be let off the hook by your choices, but that's not what he's talking about here because he shows grace. And see, here's the thing. The law punishes, but grace empowers. And see, when we receive the grace of Jesus, it empowers us to make a choice about who we're going to become. It empowers us to make a choice about what we do next when we realize that. Think about when you realize that you were forgiven by Jesus. Think about when you realized when you first came and said, God, I owe so much and you so extravagantly loved me. What, how did it feel? What did that feel like, that grace that was given to you? In that moment, you were empowered to be a different person. I talked about it last week. It changes us from the inside. You are empowered to be different. Your spirit is made alive, and then you make a choice. What do you do from there? Because that's what empowerment means. You have a choice. It empowers you to go out and say, okay, I'm going to live this kind of grace, or I'm going to receive it and then not give it. And so this guy that was forgiven by the king was empowered in that moment by the grace of the king to make a choice. And he made a really poor one because look what he goes and does. It says, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. This guy who had just been forgiven more than 10, like a thousand lifetimes of debt to the king and is just groveling at his feet and the, and the grace that empowered him to go out and make a decision says, thank you, I got it. And then he goes out and finds somebody who owes him a few thousand bucks. He owed 10 million. Somebody owed him a few thousand. He got grace. He goes out and beats up the guy who owes him money. Think about that. Again, this is a parable that Jesus is trying to get people to think about then trying to get Peter and everyone else around him listening to realize to hold up a mirror to say, who are you in this story? Well, we're the debtor that received grace from Jesus for what we owed, but very often we're also this guy who then goes out and it refuses to give it to people who need it from us. We're that same person very often in our lives, aren't we? So the guy goes on because he begged for mercy. He felt the, the fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it he pleaded. The same thing that the, servant, the guy just did to the king. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. He did the exact opposite of what the king had just done for him. The exact opposite. The grace that he had been given empower, that empowered him to change, he went out and used it to abuse somebody else. See, in, the, in some other translations, let's say a few thousand dollars, it says like a hundred denarii, which denarii was the, their money back then. It would have been a day's wage for somebody back in the day. So 100 days wages is what this guy owed this person and he couldn't forgive him. He had been forgiven and the forgiveness stopped with him. He chose not to forgive what was owed to him but instead to do to this man what should have been done to him. 
And so when some of the other servants saw this, they were upset. They were like, whoa, this guy is not, what is he doing? So they went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. And that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. There's not a lot of translation that's needed for this parable, guys. <laughs> Gotta be honest. You know, that's kind of, that's Jesus slamming the back door. That was Jesus' mic drop on his people. Going, listen, I, I made this story pretty clear. Forgiveness is paramount to who we are as believers. Now, again, he's speaking to Christians in this parable. He's not speaking to the crowd of unbelievers. He's talking to people who know Jesus, who are asking about how, well, how do they interact with other believers? How do they interact with people today would be in the church that you know? How do we treat them? And he's saying, if you want to have this foundation of forgiveness that leads to freedom, it starts with remembering the extravagant and costly love and forgiveness we have received. But then you have to understand something about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just about getting over something. Forgiveness is all about freedom. Jesus defines it as a kid. It's about freedom, walking in that freedom. Now, what happens very often is, is that we think we're free, but we're really not. Because when you hold on to bitterness, when you hold on to resentment, you are anything but free. See, this guy who received grace, who received the empowerment and was set free, he went out and did the exact opposite of somebody else because internally he was still caught up in his own desire for justice and vengeance. He was not free. Even though he was given freedom, he did not live out of that freedom. And that's exactly what happened when we hold on to resentment and bitterness towards people. We think we have free. We've been offered freedom from Jesus, but we are not living free at all. In fact, if you see the end of this story, what happens is the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. And that's an amazingly expressive phrase that he uses there. And it might seem harsh and cruel. You're like, Jesus wouldn't send you to be tortured by people. Well, then you know what happens? He's not talking about physically being put and being beaten by people. What he's talking about is when we don't forgive, we are living in a prison of our own making. And we are tortured by the gnawing resentment that eats at us every single time that person's name is mentioned, every time a thought comes out that reminds us of that incident, every time we're around something and we can't let it go, we are eaten alive and tortured by those feelings of bitterness, of hate, of envy. And it's a horrible feeling, isn't it? If you've known it and experienced it, it will eat you alive. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's exactly what it's designed to do. It's a torture. And we are in that prison very often by our own making. Because when we hold on to the bitterness that comes from something somebody did to us, anger, you know, the Bible says, don't give, you know, don't, deal with your anger every day. Don't give the devil a foothold. So you've heard that verse from James. The reason that's so important is because the idea for foothold, really the word is it's top, topos, and which I, it doesn't mean just like a, a foothold if you think of rock climbing. It means ground. Like don't give the devil ground in your life because what happens when you hold on to that is it, take, it starts with a little piece of ground and, and that ground gets bigger. Right? And then that foothold becomes a stronghold. And that stronghold becomes a fortress of defense. And very quickly, we are living in a prison of our own making because we, we refused, just like that servant, to forgive. And so we're handing ourselves over to the torturers. And we're living in a tortured existence that doesn't need to be the case. And when we don't release that hurt, it turns into resentment. And resentment will kill us. Because resentment means that we feel the same emotion, that initial pain from the very beginning. We feel it over and over and over again, every time we think about it. And that is the prison that we get trapped in when we refuse to walk into the freedom of forgiveness that Jesus gives us. See, there was a, there was a, uh, there was a, a professor at a college who actually did a study with some of her students about this idea of resentment and forgiveness. And so she did a study where she asked them to think about forgiving someone who hurt them. So just think about someone who's forgiven you, or you need to forgive, someone who's hurt you. Think about that person. And she found that when they were focusing on the person that hurt them, when they were focusing on the unforgiving responses, their blood pressure went up, their heart rates increased, their brow muscles tensed, meaning their face got all squished, and negative feelings inside them started to build up and bubble up. 
So by, 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 by thinking about that, just the unforgiveness, thinking about the person, it changed physically and biologically what was going on inside of them. But then she found, by contrast, when they thought about forgiving responses, it induced calmer feelings and had physical, emotional, calming responses. So her conclusion, the secular professor, was this, that harboring unforgiveness comes at an emotional and physiological cost to all of us. So this science has proven how dangerous unforgiveness is to us, mentally, physically, emotionally. This is not just a biblical concept. Jesus is saying, I mean, if you want to live in this, you can live in it. That's your choice, but it's going to kill you. It's going to eat you up from the inside out. And maybe some of you guys know that personally, or you've seen it happen to someone you know. They, are, they don't let this go. Because the definition of forgive, if you look up Merriam-Webster in the dictionary, the definition is to give up resentment. To give up resentment. Saying, I have a right what you did to me is not okay, and I could hold this against you, but I'm going to give that up. Because if I hold on to resentment, it's going to eat me alive. Now, I have seen this in someone's lives actively. I have seen people who had physical ailments, like a woman who had a bad back. I have seen someone get physically healed when they gave up resentment. <laughs> when we were praying, and they finally forgave the person they had been holding on to unforgiveness for for years talking, I knew a woman who held on to it for decades and would not let it go, and she had all kinds of issues, especially a back issue, and when she finally brought that person to the Lord and gave up the resentment and forgave it, her back pain was gone. Now, that's an amazing miracle of Jesus, but that's also proof to how much it messes with us physiologically and physically. I know a young girl one time, and I'll, I'll tell this story and move on, but we had a young girl in our youth group at the last church we were at that had immense physical pain. She was born with it. It was a, it was a nerve issue that she had where basically everything she touched made her hurt, right? She couldn't sit on the grass, it hurt. She couldn't lay in the sheets, it hurt. She couldn't touch a wall, it hurt. It just, she was constantly in pain, and she had learned to live that way, but if she sat too long on something, she would get swollen, and she had to have, like, those pressure socks on all the time. She was constantly in pain. We went to a conference a few years ago, and at that conference, during one of the sessions, she really felt the Lord was saying, there's some stuff in your heart that I want you to deal with. So in that, at the end of that, conf- at the end of that session, she got down on her knees, and for the next 20 minutes, she just surrendered everything to Jesus, and she just gave up everything in that moment. She asked for forgiveness for all the things that she'd been holding on to, and then she told me she went on and she forgave everybody else that she'd been holding stuff against her entire life. And she had a rough family life, and she had a lot of things that she had been holding on to, if you knew her story, and she forgave that on the spot. No one knew that she did this, by the way. This is something she just did because she felt the Lord called her to do it. Well, she went back to the room, and, uh, and she was like, she didn't really think much about it after that. She woke up the next morning, and she's laying there in bed, and she's like, she's like feeling the sheets. She's like, wait a second. She's like, this doesn't hurt anymore. That's kind of weird. I've never, I've never felt just like hotel sheets always hurt me because they're too crinkly. She's like, that's kind of strange, whatever. So she went outside, and she's sitting down on the grass, and she's journaling, and a few minutes in journaling, she realized she's like, I'm sitting on grass, and it doesn't hurt anymore. That's bizarre. Like, it's always hurt me to sit here. And then she started putting two two together. She's like, wait a second. So then she's like, like touching walls and like walking along, feeling things. And she, she looked like she'd been blind her whole life and all she, she could see the way she was acting because every time she had touched stuff, it hurt her and it was gone. She was healed. Unbelievably so. It was amazing. And if you ask her to tell, your story, or tell her story, she'll say it started when she surrendered everything and forgave all the things she'd been holding back. And she gave in to that for the need to forgive and said, Lord, I don't want to live in prison anymore. <laughs> I want to live free. And when she freed herself from that prison, it brought amazing healing in her life. And so it messes with us when we choose to live in that prison because it's exactly what we do. It's a choice. It's a choice to keep ruminating on the things that people have done to us over and over and over again. The idea of ruminating is something maybe you've heard before, but it basically means to chew on something you've already digested, <laughs> is what that means. So you can think of an animal who does that, right? A cow, a sheep, like it's disgusting. They chew, they swallow, they spit it back up, they chew on it some more, right? That's just a gross thing they do. You know what? We do the same thing with past hurt and pain, don't we? We, 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 we digest it, we swallow it, and then we bring it back up and chew on it some more, and do, we ruminate on what God, what's been done to us over and over and over again. And as we ruminate on that, we, we keep ourselves locked in a prison of our own making. See, Lewis Mead says to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Right? 
I mean, how often do we think it's somebody else? Forgiveness is not about the other person. Forgiveness is about you being free. In fact, Nelson Mandela said this. When, now, if you know the story of Nelson Mandela, he was unjustly imprisoned for a very long time, <laughs> very long time, and it wasn't, it wasn't really legal what had happened to him. And then as he's leaving prison after being there for a super long time, this is what he says in his autobiography. He says, I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom. I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. <coughs> wow. <laughs> That's someone who had every right to hold on to bitterness and hate. And he chose to say, listen, I know if I don't move on from this, if I don't give up resentment, I will still be in that prison even though I'm free. Even though I'm free. So because forgiveness is about freedom. It's about freedom. In fact, Nelson Mandela is also the guy who said, for unforgiveness is like swallowing poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> Same guy who said that. And maybe you've experienced that. It's like, I'm just going to stay mad at you for so long that it's going to hurt you. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> like you're just hurting yourself. We're just walking in, really, we seem free, but we're not. And we were designed to be free. Remember, forgiveness is the foundation to a life of freedom. And Jesus is teaching that in this parable that, man, when you get that, when you get how extravagantly you've been forgiven and you realize that it's about you being free, not necessarily I'm going to forgive the other person, because a lot of times we want to hold on to it because we don't want the other person to be free. We don't want to let them off the hook. We don't let them get away with what they did to us. But what we don't realize is it has no effect on them whatsoever. We're doing it to ourselves. Forgiveness is about us being free. And the last thing we have to realize is that forgiveness is not optional, <laughs> right? Forgiveness is the foundation for a life of freedom. And that, if you're a believer, if you follow Jesus, if you're in this room and you've committed and walking your life with them, it is not an option for us to forgive. A lot of times people want it to be. We think it should be. It's not optional. Jesus never gave that option. At the end of this parable, he didn't say, now, if you want to forgive, go ahead and do it. But if you don't, that's fine. Hold on to it. He said, no. He said, um, you forgive like your heavenly father has forgiven you or you're misunderstanding this whole thing. In fact, it, it echoes very quick, very much what he taught people in um, the Lord's prayer to pray, right? A few chapters earlier in Matthew, Matthew chapter six, he talks about forgive us our debts as we forget our, forgive our debtors. This parable echoes that very much. We had a great debt that was paid. How can we then hold something against somebody else? How do we do that? Why do we do that? See, our, follow, our Christian, our relationship with Jesus is based on the simple idea that one man was willing to take on the act of all of our sin, putting everything on himself of everybody who ever hurt him and then chose not to hold it against us. He went to the cross to prove how extravagantly he wanted to love us and how much he desired for us to be free. So then how do we do this? Maybe you're thinking in your head right now, okay, I get it, and yes, I've harbored bitterness, I've harbored resentment, there's things that have been done to me, or maybe currently I'm in a situation right now where I'm feeling like there's things being done to me. You know, I got this person that I just, just feel like at work is just hurting me on purpose. I have my, my relationship with my spouse or relationship with my kids. or There's people that you just feel like you're in that situation right now where it's hard not to want to hold on to resentment and bitterness and to, and to, to stay feeling justified with the anger. What do we do with that? See, again, Jesus wasn't, when Peter came to Jesus at the beginning of this parable, he was looking for a how. Okay, Jesus, tell me how many times I have to do it so I know when I'm done. And Jesus flipped that and said, okay, the how doesn't really matter right now. What matters is the why. <laughs> why are you going to forgive? Because if you don't get the why part right, you'll never actually forgive people. We, we as people want the how because we want to be done with it, don't we? But tell, Jesus, tell me the three steps of being, you know, getting rid of this, this feeling, and I'll do that so I can be done with it. But we don't understand the why of doing it. If you don't understand why you're forgiving, you'll never actually forgive anybody. You might have a couple steps towards it, but it won't set you free. So Jesus flips it and said, okay, get the why. Start with how much you've been forgiven. Understand that it's about you being free. Understand that it's not an optional thing for us to do if we want to live that life of freedom. And then what do you do? Well, here's a couple suggestions. Again, not found in this parable, but as we live this out, these are just from experiences that I've had and want to pass on to you. Number one thing is admit that you've been hurt. Start there. Identify what's hurt you. You can only forgive what's been done to you. And you can only forgive what you know has been done to you, what you're willing to identify. You have to call it like it is and be honest about it. 
Remember the anger thing we talked about a couple weeks ago? Anger is a great director to what's hurt you. It's always a secondary emotion. Remember I said it's like a metal detector for our soul? It will lead you to what is there, but you have to identify it first. Identify the hurt that's there and what it actually is. Call it out for what it is. It might be hard. And by the way, all these things, these are not, this is not an easy thing to do. He just never said this was easy. That's why it requires him and his Holy Spirit to do this. And if you need help with this, get help to do it. Seek a counselor. Seek somebody who can help walk you through, because I know some of us have some deep emotional and pain and things we need to walk through to forgive. And I, I identify that, and I'm not minimizing that at all. But get help to start to do this so you can be free. Because very often we don't walk in freedom because we choose not to. So identify the pain. And then say this one simple thing. Call out what the pain is and then say, but I choose to forgive him or her. Add that statement to the end of what you're saying. <laughs> this person hurt me deeply, but I choose to forgive them. And say it out loud, as awkward as that might make you feel. If you need to get a loan to do that, that's fine. <laughs> I don't necessarily feel like you want to do that in the middle of the grocery store or anything like that. But fi find some place alone to practice this, to say, well, sit with the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you've been stuck in prison, where you've been dealing with the idea of resentment. And by the way, a, a, a key to knowing where you're stuck is the conversations that play in your head. When you're there and you're having the same conversation over and over and over again in your head with the same people, that's a good place to start. <laughs> you know why? Because in those conversations in our head, we always win, don't we? <laughs> like, like in our conversation in our head, we always, we always win those conversations. But those conversations, what they're showing is that in our soul, we are harboring something. Pay attention to those conversations in your head. Don't ignore them. Jesus can use those to point to where he wants to work. Identify it. Say it for what it is. Then choose to say, I forgive them. And then repeat. <laughs> Wash, lather, repeat. That's kind of this idea of forgiveness, right? Because forgiveness is repetitive action. It's not one and done. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. And the more, I know the deeper the pain, the more you have to do it. I get that. But you've got to start with a repetitive action of, they hurt me, it's not okay. <laughs> but I choose to forgive them. And you keep saying, and you keep reminding yourself of that day in and day out until it starts to become natural. And until you know when you've done that is when you can think about them and you can think about what happened and have peace. That's when you know you've, you, you've actually gotten to that point of forgiving that person. So I always say we've done it and then you really, we really haven't, right? Yeah, I did, I stood up, I said I forgave them, I did the forgiveness thing. But really when you think about it, you're still really angry inside. You're still, when you're by yourself, you still have those conversations where you think about letting them know what you really want to let them know. Right? It's when you have peace when you think about that person. You can finally say, you know what, I've gotten to that place of recognizing that I, I have forgiven. So identify what it is, call it out by name, and repeat, but I choose to forgive them because it is a choice that we are given. It's a choice that we are given to live a life of freedom or not. But forgiveness is the foundation to build our life on if we want to be free. Now it's up to us to go and choose what we do with that, isn't it? So let me ask you this question as the worship team comes back up. We're going to end with communion today. It's a communion Sunday for us. And so this reminder of communion is exactly what we're talking about today. A reminder of just how much we've been forgiven. Just how much the extravagant and costly love of Jesus paid for our debt that we could never pay back in a million years. He went to the cross to prove how much he wants us to be free. It's a reminder of how then we are empowered to be people through his presence and this Holy Spirit living in us who go out and give that same kind of extravagant and yes, sometimes costly forgiveness. Because I will tell you something, forgiveness can cost us too. It will cost us, all right? Let me just say can, it will cost us if we're gonna live a life of forgiveness. But when we've been forgiven much, we forgive much. And Jesus says, if this is what I've done for you, how can you not? then to turn and do it for others. And he does it and tells us that not so we be gluttons for punishment because just like everything else Jesus tells for us, he knows it's what's best for us because he wants us to be free. And so as you come to the table in just a few minutes, as you're taking this, let it be a reminder of just how extravagantly you are loved and forgiven. Let it be a challenge to lay down before you do this anything you have held against somebody else that needs to be dealt with right here and right now. 
So ask yourself these questions. Who do I need to forgive? Where have I been harboring bitterness and resentment? And this last question, which is sometimes the hardest of all, where do I need to forgive myself? Where have I held on anger and bitterness towards me that Jesus already forgave? (laughs) That when I asked for forgiveness, he gave it freely. Where have I held on to that against myself? Because sometimes we're the hardest people to forgive, aren't we? We are the hardest on ourselves. And Jesus wants to say, "Uh uh-uh, that's still a prison. (laughs) You still need to be free of that. I forgave you. It's time for you to forgive yourself and move in that as well. So what are those areas? And so take a second as they lead us. Seek the Lord on that. Deal with it. And then come to the table freely knowing you are loved and forgiven. And we are called to be people who go out and do the same. Because that's the foundation of freedom we want to build our lives on. And when you do that, the world will notice. And the kingdom will grow. So God, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for the promise that you are a forgiving God. Lord, that you've called us to do the same. God, so the things that we are dealing with, that we have wanted to hold on to, the things that we have felt like we haven't been able to get past, Lord, I pray right now for breakthrough in those areas. Pray that we would lay them down, God. We would trust you that even if we never get to see that person again or we can't even talk to them, Lord, it's not about getting an I'm sorry from them, Lord. It's about us being free today. So we lay it down at your feet. We choose to forgive. We choose to walk in the empowerment given to us by your death on the cross, the new life you've given us to be different than the world around us. To walk in freedom, even when everyone else seems like they're all about vengeance and revenge, God, we can walk in the freedom of grace, of knowing that you've (laughs) you've set us free. So in this moment, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your resurrection to prove that you are who you say you are. Lord, we walk in that. Lord, we open the prison doors today the doors that we have set ourselves in, we we unlock them with forgiveness today and we walk out into the newness of life that you've given us. Holy Spirit, do your work. Pinpoint. Place your loving hand on those areas and bring freedom, I pray.